It's a joy to gather together as the people of God. Welcome to our time of worship this morning at Paradise Holschwam. Just have a few announcements before we begin the service. First of all, a reminder that tomorrow at uh, 7 o'clock here is our consistory meeting. So for those consistory members, we'll be meeting here in person. Also, we want to offer our care and condolences to Diane Milkoff and her family and the passing of her mother, who's been on hospice for a long time, uh, so we knew this time was coming, but still we want to offer our care and condolence to Diane and her family. And I'd ask that we would keep Shonda's mom in our prayers. Uh, she sent me a text last night that her mom had to go to the emergency room with breathing difficulties and severe pain. I haven't heard an update since then, so I told Shonda that we would be praying for her family and her mother in particular. I see that there are also still a bunch of chocolates in the back, so please don't hesitate to grab one of those from the Sunday School Board on the way out. Uh, otherwise, I think Brian will be eating all of them, and, uh, <laughs> and I don't think Gene wants that, so please do help with some of those uh, Easter chocolates that are still at the back of the sanctuary. Are there any other announcements this morning? And let's prepare our hearts to worship as we listen to the prelude.
Please now join in our invocation hymn, verse 1 of number 356, I will sing of my Redeemer. Gracious God, we know that you are with us, and so we welcome you to this place. We welcome you into our lives. We ask that you would fill us in a powerful way, that we would be transformed by your presence. God, thank you for the radical display of love and the victory beyond imagination that we celebrate with Easter. And we ask, Lord, that as we live in the light of that holy day, that we may forever be transformed. And that's why we are here to worship you. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join with me in our call to worship, taken from Psalm 19. Please respond in the bolded print. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. Amen. Please join in our opening hymn, number 66, To God Be the Glory.
Indeed, God has done great things. He has done the great work in our life in the purchase of sin that we have in his blood. Friends, it is right that we would live reflecting God's glory. And yet we know that we have not always lived in accordance with God's will and desire for us. Therefore, I invite you to join with me as we together confess our sins in our unison prayer. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Let us now silently confess our sins to God. Having now confessed our sins to God and neighbor, friends, hear the good news, that it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we find forgiveness, we find the cleansing of our sins, and we find the guidance to move forward in obedience and glory to God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of John, beginning at chapter 16, verse 33, continuing to verse 5 of chapter 17. John 16, beginning at verse 33. I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you ha will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Our next reading is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 through 12. Beginning now at verse 5. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things, and now you know that what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power, I'm in the wrong chapter, pardon me. There we go. This is why it makes more sense. Now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning at verse 5, not chapter 2. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled, and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and that by his power he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. 
We pray this so that in the name, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you, and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's once again turn to the Lord in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity you have given us to gather as your people, for the refreshment that we find in the forgiveness of sins that encourages us to remain faithful on our journey of obedience and living in accordance with your will. And yet, Lord, we come as people with heavy burdens on our hearts. We come as people who are tired and weary and need rest knowing that you are the only source of true rest that we can have. We come as people who need your leading and guidance, knowing how to live in the midst of a world that can be confusing and frightening, where there are many voices shouting at us, and it can be so difficult to hear your voice. Lord, we are also people who are in need of your love and care. We lift to you the Milkoff family this morning, and we ask for comfort and peace for Diane as her mother has been received from this life into the life everlasting in you. And we lift to you Shonda's mother as she was rushed to the ER last night and asked that you would bring answers and healing and recovery as she's already been struggling with many difficult health issues. Lord, we know many others who are sick, who are hurting, who are grieving. Lord, their pain becomes our pain because of our love for them. And so, Lord, we ask that we would see you at work. We know that one day you will come and set all things right, but until that time, do the work of bringing your healing and redemption today. Finally, Lord, we ask that you would be working powerfully in us. We all know the things in our life that need your healing touch, brokenness of bodies, heart, mind, and spirit. Lord, may we see your restorative work today that we may go out and do the work of your church, proclaiming your goodness and living faithfully as your people. Lord, knowing that you have been faithful from generation to generation, we now join with the saints who have gone before us in praying together the prayer you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please join with me now in our sermon hymn, number 310, Thine is the Glory.
us pray. Heavenly Father, open our hearts and our minds to the work of your Spirit. Grant us lives that are transformed by your power. Grant me your words of life to proclaim this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be noticing a theme with the hymns so far, and that is the theme of glory. It's the theme that is prominent in 1 Thessalonians uh, from what I read there, or 2 Thessalonians in chapter 1. But the idea of glory is something that really, it's not an idea that we talk about too much. Uh, Glory is not common language for us. So when the Bible talks about glory, what is it speaking about? What does it mean for us to recognize the glory of God? What does it mean for us to glorify God with our lives? What does it mean Indeed, when it says in verse day, on the day when he comes to be glorified in his holy people. What does it mean that Jesus is glorified in us? Well, for us to understand the idea of glory, we have to go back to the beginning. We have to go back to Genesis and why we're here. Why are we here? Because God created us. In the beginning, God created. That's why we're here. And and what is the purpose of of God creating us. What's our special role? We're not just here to inhabit the world. Uh, God created plenty of creatures to do that, but God gave humans a special task. And there's a phrase that describes the special quality that we have that makes us different from all of the other things that God created. We are made in the image of God. You see, we as humans are made to reflect God in a special way that is not seen in anything else in all of creation. That's what it means to have the image of God. God didn't want people to make idols, to make golden statues of God to be worshipped, because how is God to be worshipped? It's God's to be worshipped and seen in people. Now, we're not to look at other people and worship them, unless... It's Jesus, of course. But we are to reflect God in a special way. That's who we're supposed to be. That's what God made us to do. Now, you all remember your Sunday school lessons. Is that what humanity did when God said, okay, I want you to rule over the earth, to have dominion over the earth. And I want you to rule like I would rule. But I'm leaving you in this beautiful place, in this creation that is going to tend to all of your needs And they say, great, God, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to listen to you and obey you perfectly, right? That's how it went. No, of course that's not how it went. We remember our Sunday school lessons. They've been given one command. Look, just don't eat from this tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in that moment, our human condition is revealed. We think that we know better than God. We think that the ways that we figure out to be human are better than the ways that God have and God has for us to be human. And that ripples out through the whole story of Scripture, that ripples out through our lives today, through all of human history. I think that's what Paul means when in the book of Romans, chapter 3, he says, he says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We were made to reflect the image of God. But do any of us do that perfectly? I don't. And I hate to say it, if you think that you do, you don't either. That's why we need our time of confession. But our lives do have a trajectory. And that's part of what Paul is talking about in the letter to the Thessalonians here. Now, we'll remember from looking at 1 Thessalonians that they were a church who had received the word of God. Then they received it well. They turned away from the worship of pagan gods. They heard this good news that God made them with a special purpose to live reflecting how God wants with their lives. And so they became obedient to the living God. But there's a problem. 
How does the world respond, especially the world in that time, to people who are living in the way that God wants people to live? Or maybe, to put it more simply, how were people responding to people who lived like Jesus did? Well, we had just had Holy Week. How did the world respond to Jesus living the perfect human life, the way that God intended people to live, with love and care and charity? Did they welcome him? No, they crucified him. And so here the Thessalonians are also being persecuted. And when you're facing persecution, it is a catalyst for growth, and I'll tell you why. Because if you're not serious about it, you have no reason to stick around. You know, I heard a frightening statistic that they're estimating that uh, due to this whole COVID season, that probably about a third of people who were in churches just won't come back. One out of every three. You know, part of why I'm a pastor is because I want you to have a vibrant relationship with God. Coming to church on Sunday and sitting in the pew for an hour is not a vibrant relationship with God. That's not being transformed into the likeness of God. That's not living as God intended us to live. Living a life that's characterized by the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Living a life that looks like Jesus, that's how we reflect the image of God. And I think when we start living those lives that reflect the image of God, that's a lot more satisfying than going to church for an hour on Sundays. Those are the kind of people who, in the face of hardship, stick it out. In the face of persecution, don't walk away from their faith. Now, we aren't people, thankfully, who have faced a lot of persecution in our lives. But here, it's an important understanding for us, because let's not kid ourselves. A life of faithful obedience goes against our human nature. It may be how God intended us to be, how we're best made reflecting the image of God. But if we were there with Adam and Eve in the garden, I imagine we would all be eaten from that fruit just like they were. So they are facing persecution. But Paul assures them that a time is coming. And he's already talked about this back in 1 Thessalonians. A time when Jesus will return. Because for us who are living as the people of God, do we always live in the way that our hearts wish we would live? I don't. I wish I did, but that's why I have times of confession every week. Because it's a reminder that even when we do our best, we still fall short. Even when we try our hardest, that it's still not enough, is it? But there's good news in here for that as well. So he says here, once again, in verse 5, All this evidence that God's judgment is right and the result that you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God uh, for which you are suffering. So all this is evidence of that. Their hardship that they are suffering, well, Paul doesn't say just tough it out. God uh, is with you. God says, look, Jesus was persecuted. When you live like this, when you live reflecting the glory of God, the image of God, it's going to be difficult. However, don't be discouraged. Verse 6, God is just. He will pay back trouble for those who trouble you and give relief to those who are troubled and to us as well. So he says clearly here there's two paths that we can be on. The path of living like God intended us. God, how God intended us to be, living, reflecting that we are made in the image of God, living lives of love, and peace, and joy, patience, lives of generosity and care, lives of loving our neighbor as ourself and loving God. Or we can live the path of sin in the garden, saying that we know best, that I know best. God, you think you know what it means to be truly human, but I'll show you what it means to be truly human. We know people like that, don't we? 
and we probably know that desire in our heart more than we care to admit. God, you might know how to act in this sphere, but in this area of my life, and we can pick all the hot-button topics, can't we? The ones that pierce close to our spirit, close to our soul. But when it comes to what I do with my desires, my body, my stuff, my money, God, I know how to handle that. Let me take care of that. So what trajectory are we on? Well, a time is coming when God, who is just, will reveal this. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. So for those who are on the path following God, are they living perfectly? No. And we'll get to this in a little bit. But they're heading in a direction. They're saying, I want to live in a way that reflects your glory, your image, being made to reflect you, God. And there's the people who don't know God and don't obey the gospel. Now think, if you were the Thessalonians, who would these groups be? It's the group of faithful believers. Those are the people who are going to uh, have their trouble, the trouble that they've been given. God will pay back others and will give them relief. And the people who are causing them trouble, I think that this message is important because it says those people who are causing you trouble, God sees what they're doing too. And their path that is moving them away from God will come to a conclusion when Jesus returns. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. And it makes sense, right? I mean, there's the people who are going towards God and the people who are going away from God. If we keep on going on those paths, they go somewhere. And God will say to those who don't want to be with him, you're not with me. And say to the people who want to be with him, you are with me. And what happens to us who want to be with him? Well, again, we're not perfect people. We're not fitting to be in God's presence, are we? We haven't lived up to be as good as we want to be, as reflecting of Jesus in our lives as we want to be. Well, here's good news. So on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and marveled at among all those who have believed. Part of what we do is we worship and bring glory to God. And this is one aspect of the idea of glory. We come and we sing praises to praise God. We are practicing a worship of God, something that we will do. That's the second half of this. He comes to be marveled at among all those who have believed. When we get to see Jesus fully in his glory, where was a picture of that, by the way, in the Gospels? At the transfiguration, when he's up on that mountaintop, shining in his glory. When we get to see Jesus revealed as he is, remember what I read in John, that he is going back to the Father and he will have the glory. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus humbled himself, taking on this human form. Jesus doesn't look very glorious on the cross, does he? But when he comes and returns, he will return in glory and we will say, yes, praise God, this is what I've been waiting for. But then we might also realize, like someone who shows up underdressed at a wedding, that oh, I'm not ready for this. I'm not prepared. How, how can me, Paul, a sinner, stand in the face of such glory? Stand in the presence of God. I'm not worthy of that, but this is the beauty. How is God, how is Jesus glorified? He comes to be glorified in his holy people. One of the commentaries I looked at for this used the image of a filament in a light bulb. 
You know, not these new fancier bulbs, not LEDs, but you remember the ones with the filament when the, and you look at it and it's fine, but then once you click on the power, you can't look at it because the electricity is running through it and it gets hot and it shines brightly. That's the presence of God in us. If we're made to reflect the image of God, can we do that without God in our lives? No. That's the problem of the garden. And so what's this picture at the end? That like a light bulb that is always switched on, God is in us, illuminating us. We will live as we are supposed to. And that's the desire of our hearts, of us who follow Jesus. So that's why it's good news that he's returning. Now, for those who don't follow Jesus, that's not good news because they won't be fitting to be in the presence of God. And they don't want God working in them. But for us who do, we know that we're not fitting and God works in us. And again, here's that good news. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you. The the good news that they had brought when we looked at it back in Acts. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and that by his power he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness. And your every deed prompted by faith. Friends, sometimes the best we can offer is heartfelt desire and a little bit of effort. But it doesn't always get us that far. Because we're not strong enough. Because we don't have the strength, we don't have the power, because we don't have the ability on our own. But again, this is why it's good news. When Jesus sees that that's where we want to be, he says, okay, I'm going to work in you. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling. Is it us who makes ourselves worthy of God's calling of us? No. That's human thought. That's sinful thought. That if I'm good enough, I'll earn it. What's the thought as we are made? Well, we are built to reflect Jesus. And so the one who does that work is the one who made us. That's good news, that God may make you worthy of his calling. And is it by our strength and effort alone? Well, I hope not, because my strength and effort fails me. And of course, what does it say? And that by his power, he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. Friends, we do make progress in this life towards God. It's not as much as we would hope. And we don't get where we want to be. But we are on a path. This is the calling here. What path are we on? What path is your life on? Are you living on the path that says, God, I know best? A lot of those people aren't in a church today. They've said, I know best. Or are we on the path that says, God, I was made to reflect you. I was made in your image. I was made to bear your glory, but I can't do it on my own. I need your help. I need you to work in me. The day is coming, friends, when those paths will come to their end. Paul encourages us and those Thessalonian believers to stay true to the path that leads to life, to stay true to the path that lets the glory of God be revealed in us because of God's work in us, to stay true to the path of Jesus, even if that's a path of hardship, even if that's a path of pain, even if that's a path that leads to death on the cross. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. We get to that place not by our own strength and effort, but by God's grace in us. May we stay faithful on the path that Jesus has showed us and that God made us to live on. Amen. 
Friends, I invite you now to join with me as we affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed as they are printed in our bulletins. Friends, what is it that we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, we have a God who is good and generous, who does mighty works in our lives, in us and through us. We seek to reflect God's love and generosity in all that we do. And so may we now sing together acknowledging God's blessings. Join with me now as we sing together number 730, our closing hymn, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory.
says this, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. May we live as people on that same path of Jesus, the path that lives reflecting the image of God, the path that overcomes this world. Receive now the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.